We invite you to worship with Tabernacle Baptist Church. Five services, multiple locations. Tabernacle, Maine, 1223 Laney Walker Boulevard, Augusta, Georgia, 715 a.m., 945 a.m., and 1215 p.m. And Tabernacle West, 702 North Bel Air Road, Evans, Georgia, 9 a.m. and 1115 a.m. God wiped out every living thing on the earth, people, livestock, small animals that scurry along the ground, and the birds of the sky. All were destroyed. Only people who survived were Noah and those who were with him in the boat. And the floodwaters covered the earth for 150 days. Look again. The Bible says the only people who survived were Noah and those who were with him in the boat. For this first Sunday of the year. Maybe this is your declaration. This is what I want to simply talk about. I survived it. I survived it. Lord, speak. Your people need to hear. I can only imagine what it must have felt like to be in that boat. Can you imagine as the boat rocked and reeled based upon the wind and the waves? At this particular time, what had overcome the world was not a local event. It was a global event. That at that time that this boat was in the water, that in case Noah's family and some animals, there was no dry land to be seen at all. And as they rocked and reeled on this water, can you imagine what was going on? Can you imagine this constant tension? I can imagine that perhaps Noah and his family probably had a rough time trying to stay balanced. Because even though they were floating, you can imagine that things probably was just a little bit off kilter. To make things bad, this boat, this ark, also encapsulated animals and families. When they built it, there was no plumbing included. There was none of those amenities that you and I would think would make it a luxurious ride. And I can imagine that not only was there some uneasiness on this ride, but also it probably didn't smell well, right? Maybe it was not the best situation to be in, but in spite of all that, they were still floating on the water. And I think there's something powerful in that because if we be honest about life, perhaps life on that boat speaks about what life is for you and I now. There is this motion that we're getting. Let's be honest. It seems as if we can never get our equilibrium together. Balance seems to be unattainable. And yes, we're floating, but we're also struggling. And the stench of the things that's taken on around us, I can imagine it has become nauseating. And if the truth be told, perhaps you feel like that old person said, I feel like telling God, stop the world and let me get on. And in the midst of that, you're floating. And here you are. I mean, you're not consumed. You're still alive. But at some point, you're struggling because the waters are still raging and there's no dry land to be seen. That's why as we begin to start this series, Reset, as we look at the life of Noah, this opening passage that I'm focusing in on raised so much ire for me. I, I will admit that it was a tension that I struggled with because if we read the text correctly around verse 23, it tells us the only ones that have survived is Noah and those who were with them. But here is the trip. They're still floating on the water. There is no end in sight, but the text says... They survive. And for many of us, that perhaps is the challenge because we would oftentimes say that survival has to come when we're through it. We're, that we want to say survival comes when the land has dried out, when the situations are over, when the things that we have been wrestling with are no longer a problem. But the text seems to give you and I an idea that many times God begins to stamp us as survivors while we're still floating. 
Well, while we're still trying to get our equilibrium, God says you still survived it. While we're still trying to figure out when the end is going to be, God still says uh, you have survived it. And maybe that's where we are as we open up this brand new year, a year that with all these fresh expectations, we're still floating on the same issues we wrestled with on last year. Perhaps it's a flood of for the virus, a flood of racial injustice, a flood of division, a flood of economic collapse, a flood that seemingly has no end but like Noah we can declare we have survived and I believe that's something for you and I to really dig deep in and that's my aim today in this little message I really want us to really think I really want us to sit aside to ponder to meditate because as bad and as rough as 2020 is, I know many of us are still in the throes of it, still struggling with a lot of those things. I want you to know that the declaration is clear right from Scripture. Here is why you can still praise God uh, while you're floating in the flood, why you can still honor God uh, and there's still no end in sight. It's because God's goodness can keep you uh, when you can't keep yourself. That this is why Noah and those who were with them could uh, be excited that even though it was not the best situation, Situation. Here's the good news. They survived. And after all we had in 2020, as we look to our nation, the thousands upon thousands who lost their life, if we saw thousands upon thousands who lost jobs and who lost homes as we are now still enthralled in a flood of epic proportion as we're trying to navigate this uncertain world, here's the good news that with all that going on, you can still be a survivor in the midst of a flood. And I really want us to look at that. Because I know for us to think through it, there's a lot that could have overcome us last year, a lot that could have consumed us, a lot that could have took us down, a lot that honestly we had no answers for. And let's be honest, we weren't as strategic as we needed to be. Our intellect was not that strong. We didn't make all the greatest decisions, but yet here we are, the first weekend of the year, and we can declare we survived. Yes, we may have less than we started with last year, but we survived. Yes, we may not have the things we had when we were together last year, but we still survived. And there's something to be said when you and I acknowledge the fact that after all we have been through, we are still here. And I want to look at that because I think that as we begin to consider that, especially in the context and the life and legacy of Noah, we began to see that he teaches you and I these moments, these pivotal moments that we should not overlook. I know, I know you had your New Year's resolution, and I know that you already started with your devotional and prayer, and I know you're excited about the fast, but every now and again, you ought to thank God that you are still here. You may not get a new car in 2021, but you're still here. You may not get that new job or promotion, but you are still here. At some point, we need to learn how to thank God in the midst of what we're going through and say, God, what could have happened didn't happen. I am grateful that I survived. And I want to look at that. I want to examine that for a little while. Let's, let's put some historical context on this text. Let's begin to see it from the perspective of Noah because you can imagine as we read the genealogy that is lifted up in chapter 5, the question is raised, why Noah? Why was Noah, out of all the people in the world, the one that God chose to survive out of everything that happened that God decided it was Noah and those connected to him that will survive this flood. And I want to challenge you today because I know that sometimes being a survivor can oftentimes raise in our psyche survivor's remorse. Sometimes we try to figure out why are we the ones that made it when others didn't make it. And I know that that can be a challenge, but I want you to focus on the reality of God's grace and God's mercy, God's goodness, even in the midst of what seems to be a strong flood. Let, let me examine it. There's three things I see in the text. I want you to write these. I really want you to take copious notes this series. I'm not sure which way I'm going to come every week, but I do believe these are building blocks for us to think through. As you're going through the period of your week, my aim is that you begin to think through these things, create a journal. How can I start over this year? How can I take the word that I have heard? Because the Bible is clear. Don't just be hearers of the word, but be doers. So what's the first thing that we can glean? Well, I want to suggest that one of the key components of the survival of Noah when we began to study his life is that Noah, watch this, had an adherence to God's calling. In other words, what I want you to know is that Noah took seriously the call of God on his life. Go back and rummage back a couple of chapters. Matter of fact, 
In chapter 5 of Genesis, you began to see the genealogy from Adam, the first, or Adam, to Noah. You, you begin to see how it flows from Adam to what we see in Noah. Now, when you read the beginning portion of Genesis, it gives us the incredible insight of God's creation narrative. That's why Genesis 1, 2, 3, and 4 begins to talk about this moment of utopia when God created humanity and humanity failed. Sin got humanity kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And from that point forward, it seems as if humanity has been trying its best to figure out how to operate in relationship with God. But you'll notice in the first couple of chapters of the Bible that this was a failed experiment. That for some reason, the wickedness of the world had many times thwarted their perspective. And as we get to the time of chapter 5 and move into chapter 6, God is now fed up. That, that's why when you read the genealogy, don't just read the names or the years. I know they can oftentimes be confusing. And I, I know for many people, especially who want to debunk scripture, we get caught up in the different ages. Because if you read the genealogy, many of them were like 900 years old. Or even Noah is 600 years old. And I'm not here to argue their chronological age. What I want you to understand is when you are trying to interpret scripture, you must always make sure the difference between facts and truth. That I could make the argument that the Bible is not intended to just try to purvey facts, but really its main aim is convey truth. So regardless of the age period, you begin to see the evolution. You begin to see civilizations begin to be developed. And then ultimately Lamech has a son by the name of Noah. And when you read chapter 5, it tells us that Noah had a divine assignment even from his birth. And when you read the story of Noah, he came with an assignment. Matter of fact, the main reason God chose him to save him was because the Bible says something about Noah. It says not about anybody else. It says that Noah is righteous. And I appreciate this. This is a foreign term for them. Matter of fact, in, in contrast with Noah and the others, this is one of the first times we even see that notion of righteousness. Now, I need to push this because I need you to understand that righteousness does not mean perfect. No, Noah was not a perfect person. We'll see a lot of the mistakes that he makes. And even when he gets through on the other side, he does uh, end up making a major mistake that ultimately costs down the line of his family. But what God can trust in the life of Noah, that in spite of everything around Noah, Noah stuck out. Noah was righteous. Noah kept God first. Noah prioritized the things of God. There were many options and temptations that could have swayed him and swerved him to once again forget his fidelity to God. But in the midst of all those temptations, he stayed true to God. And I want to suggest that Noah's testimony is what you and I should endeavor to do. There are a lot of things that can sometimes move us and maneuver us. There are a lot of things that if we're not careful can tempt us and cause us to miss out on what we should be focused on. But what it makes a, a bedrock of righteousness is when I get to the position to understand that I'm trying to be my best for God. I want to be all that God wants me to be. I'm not perfect, but I'm striving. I'm not perfect, but I'm trying to give God uh, my absolute best. And that's what Noah was applauded for. And the reason he's righteous is because he prioritized God. But also notice he made sure that he followed the instructions of God. Because righteousness, in essence, is not just the perspective I have of God, but it's also my perspective and my allocation and my application of his word. Now here's the crazy thing about the story of Noah is that in the midst of it all, God is ready to move on from humanity, goes and speaks to Noah, and this is what he tells him, build an ark. Now, you must understand, in those days, they had never seen rain, let alone a flood. <laughs> and at that time, there had never been such a thing as an ark. With all that going on, God asked, asked Noah to build an an ark. And the text is very clear that Noah starts out on the task. And I think there's something in this building that Noah does because when we begin to read it, you'll note that it takes 
years in order for it to come to pass that many scholars have suggested it is almost 450 feet wide and high and about 75 feet long about a thousand train cars could fit within uh, this large contraption this large uh, ark that Noah was building but in the midst of that there was a lot of people that were having their own issues they were ridiculing Noah they were bringing about their own things with Noah and the text seems to suggest to you and I that Noah kept building anyhow. That no matter what was going against him, no matter what was fretting him, no matter what was trying to ridicule him, Noah decided to stay the course. Let me tell you, when God calls you, oftentimes he calls you and I to do what seems to be something improbable and even yet unbelievable. But what truths our fidelity to God is that we take God at what God says. I'm believing as you and I are preparing to expand in this year that sometimes the assignments and instructions of God don't always make sense but build it anyhow I know there'll be a lot of people that won't understand it but build it anyhow at the end of the day success is not predicated on what they say but success is predicated on what God says how many of you know that when you step out by faith and trust in God's word and trust in God's way God will give you the wherewithal God will give you the ingenuity God will give you the strength and the strategy to accomplish what he needs Needs you to accomplish this calling of Noah. He was righteous, but he built what God told him to build. Grew up in Greensboro and down the street from the home that I was raised in was a lady by the name of Miss Thompson. She passed away a few years ago, but she was the neighborhood babysitter. When my grandparents had to go out of town or even had to work, I would go to Miss Thompson's house. It was there I had my good friends Nikki, who stayed at the corner, and Jerome, who stayed right next to Miss Thompson. And we would go to Miss Thompson's house. Miss Thompson was mean, y'all, I'll be honest. She had a wooden paddle on her wall. And I must admit, I spent a few moments with splinters in my behind for my lack of obedience. But that's neither here nor there. But I'm recalling Miss Thompson's house because of my early friendships with Nikki and Jerome. And we used to play games. Y'all know games. We would play bingo or connect four. That's how I became champion in those games. Even playing hide and go seek outside. But one game I struggled in, and that game was Simon Says. Oh, I know. I know you've, you've played Simon Says before. The, the whole premise of Simon Says is that you are given instructions. You're, you're told by the leader to do something. But here's the caveat. The only way you can succeed is that you must do the instructions that come after Simon says. So the leader would say stuff like, Simon says, touch your head. Cool. Simon says, touch your arm. Cool. But then they would do something crazy. Like they'll say, after saying, after a few times, Simon says this and Simon says that, they'll do something like, touch your leg. And I, because I wasn't listening, I was just trying to hear the instructions. I would touch my leg only to have them point at me and tell me I was out. I began to be mad. I was upset. How, what you mean I'm out? You said, touch my leg. They said, you're right. I said, touch your leg. But the premise of the game is not to follow what I said. It's to follow what Simon says. And I believe that's how life is set up for you and I, is that it's not just Simon says, it's what God says. And whatever God says determines how successful and victorious will be in our lives. That's why you got to make sure your ear is attuned to hear what God says. Because as long as God said it, you can win. But when you start trying to do things on your own or hear instruction from some other place, you can be like me mad and pouting on the side. And it's all because you didn't hear what he said. It's right here. Adherence to God's calling is a major reason why he survived. But then also notice in the text there's allegiance to God's connection. Now one of the powerful things about this passage of scripture to me is the mere fact, watch this, that it's not just Noah that survives. Noah's the one that we lift up. Noah's the one that's called righteous. Noah's the one that's given the assignment. But when it came time after the ark had been built, note what God says. God said, bring your family on board. Bring these pairs of animals, some from the sky or from the ground. Bring them on board. That Noah was the one with the assignment. Noah was the one that was considered righteous. But the saving, the ones that would benefit from his righteousness was those he was connected to. It almost seemed to suggest that God's calling on Noah was not just about Noah. But God had called Noah and selected Noah so that Noah could reach those he was close to. 
That's powerful for you and I because I think that it challenges us to understand how much bigger and broader our callings are. I will admit one of the challenges of trying to pastor and lead in this 21st century is that we can be so narcissistic and individual that we miss the reality of what God calls all of us to do. Hear me clearly. And in this day and age, most of our entourages only include me, myself, and I. But God, in essence, by calling Noah, by assigning Noah, knew that Noah's responsibility was not just to save himself, but to save others he was connected to. And maybe that's something you and I should make a priority this year in spite of everything that's going on. I wonder, when have we done a good enough job of making sure that we connect those that we work with? Can I be honest? I see so many people posting on social media talking about I'm called to the world but when was the last time you helped save your own household when was the last time you tried to make sure your spouse or your children or your extended family was saved I love this in our text because it teaches us this one simple reality that yes it was Noah's job to build the ark but watch what God also gave him responsibility to do and that was to feel the ark in other words it behooved Noah to make sure there's no reason for you to build that big of a boat and only have one seat in it but I didn't give you all that time to build that boat have all that space for you to only save yourself no no I want you to save your children and save your family and I'm gonna send some animals some things you're not even used to being close to and I want you to give them space on your boat I'm glad that this ark is a picture of the kingdom of God because you and I don't have a choice of what comes on the boat but uh, our main responsibility is to make sure that we're doing our job to feel the boat that's the kingdom of God and that's why the old season saying she's to say it this way oh come into the ship of Zion come on board because there's more than enough room can I tell you that's why I saw this last year as a great opportunity for the church to expand because with everything that was going on there's one area I knew we would never run out of room that yes the buildings may be closed but the ark still got room yes we may have COVID-19 but the ark still got room yes we had economic fallout and crazy political season but the ark still got room and I got good news to tell you that same room we had in 2020 we can still have in 2021 the ark has got enough room to fill us all with that's what we see and I want to challenge you that in this moment, not only was he commissioned to build it, but he was also commissioned to help fill it. Because the text implies, based on the tension of the Hebrew, that Noah did not send his family, he led his family. And may I make an observation that it perhaps was not the words that led the family of Noah, but may it would have been the life that led them. And for many of us, can I be honest? As I began to consider and think through this passage, you must note that the ones connected to Noah also had to endure the ridicule that Noah did. And they would endure the same type of issue that Noah would deal with. That's why this past year has taught us all, in spite of everything, our economic situations, the neighborhoods we stay in, the cars we drive, this one thing this past year has taught us that none of us are exempt from something that we saw this with people who got sick and infected and lost their lives COVID-19 didn't care if you were Democratic or Republican black or white rich or poor it almost became symbolic of the plague of the world that oftentimes we assume that just because we do something or have certain pedigree that things won't happen to us but just like in Noah's time perhaps they saw the life of Noah perhaps it was his life that spoke more than his lips. And I want to challenge each of you that as we peruse and grow and meander through this upcoming year, maybe what God is challenging us to do is make sure we bring those we're connected to on board. That it would be a shame to be saved and you be the only one. That to survive and you be the only one. That if you know what is ahead and you know that God is providing refuge, why wouldn't you try to get as many as you can on board? There was this God's calling. There was this allegiance, the God's connections. 
But then the third component I see of survival is the acceptance of God's covering. The interesting passage of Scripture to me, I know. I, I'm now in a boat, and you can see the construction that we have, the wood. And in those days, the ark was made of gopher wood. Matter of fact, you'll note that they put tar to try to make sure that there was some kind of protection on the boat. But I will admit to you that as Noah, his family, and the animals were now rocking on the water, I will admit to you that it's not the gopher wood that was able to keep them. No, it wasn't even the tar that they would put in certain spots in order to try to protect them. That was not what sealed them. That was not what allowed them in the midst of this incredible, overwhelming flood to not drown. No, I want you to know something that gives us the key ingredient to why Noah and those connected to him survive. It's right there in Genesis chapter 7, verse 16. I know I almost looked over it because if you're not careful, you'll focus on how he built the ark, and that's significant. You'll, you'll focus on the fact that he's righteous, and that, that's significant. You'll focus on the fact that the sons that get on board and the types of animals that come in. But notice verse 16 of Genesis chapter 7 because I believe that it's the precursor. It's the reason why we see him survive in verse 23 because there would be no verse 23 if there was no verse 16. Notice what happens. He survives in verse 23. Why? Because in verse 16, the Bible simply says this phrase, and God shut him in. Oh, I believe there's good news there. Because what we learn is not the gopher wood that protected them. No, it's not the tar that they put in that protected them. But it was God that once they had got on the ark that had been constructed, God himself decided to seal them in. God himself knew what the power of the flood would be. God himself knew how long they would have to wing in the water. God knew that there would be no dry land in sight. God knew that they'll be out on that water because it would rain 40 days and 40 nights and for 150 days uh, they would have to be out uh, on what seemed to be uh, a bottomless water but watch what the text says even though uh, there was something that was bigger than them uh, here's the shout uh, is that there was something that was bigger than it God uh, had shut them in God uh, had protected them God uh, had sealed them and that's all I came to tell you is that when we look over our lives we can admit uh, that no matter how righteous we've tried it still has failed us no matter how smart we try to be we're never been smart enough no matter how nice we've tried to be we never can be nice enough but here's the reason why after all that we've went through after all uh, we had to press our way through the reason we can declare we survived uh, is because God uh, has shut us in and I know I'm not the only one uh, that can look over your life and say the Lord has been shutting me in God uh, has kept me when I couldn't keep myself I'm not here because I'm the best driver in the world but God kept me I'm not here because I kept my face Thank you for joining us. If you were blessed by today's message, there are several ways to view it again for free and play it back anytime and anywhere. Visit our YouTube channel, TBC Augusta GA, and our website, tbcaugusta.org. You can also download the Tab Impact app from the Apple Store or Google Play. As always, thank you for worshiping with us at the most impactful place on the planet, the historic Tabernacle Baptist Church.